Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And see the long-term impacts of climate change. But we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. We're looking at an entire city and how it's going to move forward through the 21st century to 2050 and beyond. And we have the director of the Department of Energy and Environment, the Honorable Tommy Wells Esquire. He is the director. And the interesting thing about this is this is the first city, Washington, D.C., capital of the United States, is the first lead platinum city in the world. And uh, I'm not sure if there's been any others that have joined into that august standing or not. Uh, but Tommy Wells, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Sam, it's great to see you again, and I enjoy your show. And thank for thank you for what you do. Well, we are really appreciate you because uh, you have really been doing a fantastic job as director. And I just want to throw this in as a promotion. We now have the urban forest the rain gardens, the rain barrels, and the pavers all out of your program at the Department of Energy and Environment, and everything is working absolutely fantastic. So I don't mind being your poster child for that if you need it in the future, because uh, these four systems are doing great for uh, controlling stormwater. And thank you for doing your part to help um, clean our stormwater. That's that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and it's working very well. I and mean, we can talk about that. But uh, thank you for being here. What we're going to be talking about right now is climate change and livability in the district. How do you combine these two together, the livability and climate change? Well, as you know, <clears throat> um, climate change certainly has an impact. But the first impact is that the climate is changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be in D.C. It's going to be hotter, wetter and a little wilder, you know, in terms of storms. So in terms of livability, we have to prepare for those changes. And frankly, what we believe is that and within 30 years, our climate will be Nashville's climate, what Nashville's is today. So mm -hmm. that means that we're um, going to be doing a lot more cooling than heating. Now, that's just absolutely amazing. And uh, looking at the city, we're, of course, we're getting many of these very severe storms uh, that are coming through, and those are increasing on a year-by-year -year basis. And so what are you actually thinking about, thinking about as far as climate change and livability? And we're going to get in some of the specifics in a minute, but just how does that impact you as the director for the department? Well, for us to do our part, the the main cause of climate change from dc greenhouse gases 74 percent of the greenhouse gases dc is responsible for is from our buildings our built environment mm -hmm. and so we have a number of programs to retrofit the built environment to reduce the number of greenhouse gases but at the same time that gives us an opportunity to in low-income neighborhoods put solar on roofs bring people's power bills down um, you know, help with their cost of living. And we do community solar to where we can put solar, we've put solar farm on a, mm -hmm. on a um, brown field. And that is serving and cutting the, the bills in half for 780 households in that neighborhood in, um, in a low income area. So we, we leverage solar, we leverage retrofits of homes. We do these things to increase livability for our, for our residents. 
Yeah, and the one thing, uh, we're actually uh, adding this. So I guess this will be the fifth program between you and the department um, in Washington, D.C., is the solar. Uh, and there are a number of people in Wards 8 and Ward 7, which are some of the most economically challenged wards uh, in the district, are now paying zero as far as our power bills with the uh, new programs you have for solar. So I want to thank you for that. But looking at this chart in front of us, uh, let's go through this, Tommy. This is uh, something that we need to know about. And how do you see this playing out over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years? And I'm going to ask you this question quite a few times as we go through this today, not to be redundant, uh, but so that people really understand what you're thinking about, the philosophy, the policies, but the actions, which is most important for Emerald Planet, that you are actually doing. So we started with the Sustainable DC plan, and that's kind of the parent plan that now gets us to Climate Ready DC, Clean Energy DC, and Resilient DC. Mm -hmm. And so under that, um, we have to do two things. We have to do our part to reduce greenhouse gases that cause climate change. We, then we have to adapt our built environment to a changed climate. And then we have to um, create resiliency with our, especially low income neighbors, where mm -hmm. my recovery and resiliency plan is the credit card in my wallet. If I need to go somewhere else, be in a safer place. But we have a lot of people that are what we call unbanked. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, unfortunately, it's an issue of environmental justice. But historically, we've built affordable housing in the cheapest parts of the city where the land is cheapest. And you mm -hmm. know where that is. That's in your flood right. zone. We saw what happened in New Orleans. Um, also around your industrial areas. Those are hot areas without trees. So we have to do this in an equitable way that we um, restore the environment. We help resiliency among our, our neighbors. And then we prepare for a changed climate, which mm -hmm. is going to be, again, very intense storms, like you met, said, flooding in areas that we've never flooded before. We, um, as you know, we had a flood um, a few years ago down a canal road where people had to get out of their cars and stand on their hoods of their cars. And there was a, a national weather alert, which means you only get that when um, lives are in danger. <clears throat> this is the first one DC had ever had. And My then, goodness, it's incredible. And so then you had um, uh, another storm in the northern part of our city on September 10th. And we're still helping families clean up, get mold out and help mm. them with their, with their homes. So the, the weather's changed. We need to help our residents, but also we have to protect our assets and then do mm -hmm. our part to reduce greenhouse gases. Right. And looking at this too, the net zero new buildings, net zero retrofits, I think that is really critically important. Looking at these uh, four uh, impactful areas uh, highlight very quickly because we want to move through. There's much information we have, Tommy. Uh, these uh, four areas and how does this all fit together? Well, in terms of um, of greenhouse gases and doing our part, but then also resiliency, we know that with um, transportation that the um, our subway is now vulnerable to flooding like mm -hmm. we had not known we were before. We're with more floods in the, you know, we're on, we're on two tidal rivers, the Potomac and Anacostia. So mm -hmm. when a hurricane comes in from the coast, it pushes the Chesapeake and then DC's waters up. And we've had, um, our sea level rise has already happened over the past 50 years of about 11 inches and mm -hmm. it's accelerating. So we have to protect our, our power stations. We have to protect our subways. We have to protect the assets of the city. And then the next part is we have to protect our buildings mm -hmm. and our buildings need, um, we need to help them in flood zones. We need to help them with the high heat that, that's happening. We need to help them reduce their power, but also um, new development. Let's mm -hmm. not be putting new development, especially affordable housing in z flood zones. Mm -hmm. and as you know, Sam, the 500 year flood zone really is not 500 years anymore. That not anymore. You can get that same flood in the same year. Right. So let, let's protect people. Neighborhood and communities, we're going to need, um, you know, we need to cool our neighborhoods. We need to plant trees. As you know, trees are magic. They, mm -hmm. they cool things to make you feel better, but they renature the city. And they take up water, which is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then with our communities, 
we need to put in some resiliency hubs with solar power batteries so that they have a place to charge the phones, keep their medicines mm -hmm. cool, should their power get knocked out. And um, then of course, um, governance and implementation. That's, that's me. We yeah. develop regulations, we get laws passed. And frankly, my philosophy is you can't leave it to the market. The government has to get involved in mm -hmm. order to accelerate the changes that we need to make. Yeah, and it's really interesting, Tommy, uh, you know this because of your years on city council and being involved in around city government for uh, decades now, is that government in the United States, even though we say it's a free enterprise system, has always been involved in what's going on as far as policy is concerned. And uh, it needs to do that uh, for the future. So, and this is some of the impacts that that we're actually seeing. This is just what you were talking about. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, you know, the last two years, Sam, are, as you know, were the two wettest years on record in D.C. Mm -hmm. So we're getting more rain. We're getting more flooding. The past five years, the hottest five years. So if you mix hot with evaporation and you bring in, you know, different changing climates, you get explosive storms. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see now. Sea level rise. Um, Haynes Point, which is on the Potomac River where the channel meets, and it is um, a national park. And every day, those sidewalks are underwater for some period of the day during high tide. Mm -hmm. And you know they didn't build it that way. It's right. that sea level has risen. So the extreme weather, and gosh, we're seeing this across America, mm -hmm. the extreme weather, whether it be fires, floods, wind, um, D.C. Is, is right in that. And so we've got to right. prepare for that. Yeah. One of the things that people don't realize, you know, we're 125 plus or minus miles in, you know, from the Atlantic Ocean, but we're only three feet above sea level. And so if all any of the predictions are true, <laughs> uh, a lot of D.C. is going to be underwater in the, the next few years. But this uh, this balance between built infrastructures and community resources, how do you do that? And we're almost out of time, Tommy. So uh, let's be well, Leave your viewers with this thought. What does heat do? And we know that when heat, long periods of high heat will um, expand metal. So when we have longer and longer periods of high heat, our metro rails will warp. Mm -hmm. The train rails will warp. Everything slows down. And so it's just the science. We weren't built to be a city with this with this climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true across the United States. And uh, this is something I'll, I'll leave this up so we can go out on this. But implementation, I know this is something that you're very hands on. You're out day in and day out into the community getting after these 77 actions. So the last question is, is how are we going to take these 77 actions and then blend this in the high priority, but actually be able to fund it and underwrite it? And we've got maybe about 45 seconds to do all that. Well, the city's been very generous and the city's done well and the city's invested um, millions and millions of dollars. I Each year I have around 50 to $70 million to invest in mm -hmm. meeting our climate goals. And now that we have a new administration that believes strongly in climate change and that we have to do something about it, we're already seeing that we're getting new investments in partnership with the federal government. We can do this. We, mm -hmm. um, I, I truly believe that we've got the will and we've got the smarts to get this done. Yeah, yeah. And it goes back to what you just said. Uh, it's in the science and it also is to look at the technologies as the best way, but involving people. And I know that's what you're doing, Tommy, when you're out in the communities. This is the Honorable Tommy Wells, and he's a director of the DOEE in Washington, D.C. Thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. We're covering the first lead platinum city in the world, Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the United States. And it's just amazing the transformation that's going on here as far as moving from not really being that concerned or worrying about the environment, but being very proactive to address climate change and how we're going to address the next 5, 10, 15 generations 
of youth to come after all of us that are here now. And this is being led by the Honorable Tommy Wells, Esquire. He's the Director, Department of Energy and Environment, DOEE in Washington, D.C. And we're going to be talking about resilient uh, D.C. But Tommy, just give us uh, a very short thumbnail sketch of the Department of Energy and Environment and why is it so important and why are you becoming, in a sense, kind of the poster child uh, of energy and environment around the United States and indeed even abroad? Well, I appreciate that question because when I first became director, it was the Department of the Environment. Mm -hmm. And I participated in learning about climate change. I, was, I went to ancillary meetings at COP21 uh, where the Paris Agreement was done. And it became clear that um, energy has to be married to environment, mm -hmm. that we had to pull them together. And I had a small energy office at the Department of the Environment and realized that the future of a lot of our work would be related to energy. Mm -hmm. So I went to the mayor who went through the process to change the name to Department of Energy and Environment. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Sam, you may know this, that's the fastest growing part of this agency. It, oh, yeah. I was there as a $135 million agency. Now it's 180 million. All the growth is around energy. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to that's going to happen as we go. And of course, the technologies are improving. Uh, what is it? Uh, 80, 85 percent less expensive for solar now. Uh, you know, improvements as far as wind capturing to generate electricity that can be in built environment. So uh, it's amazing. But Resilient DC and looking at this photograph that we have in front of us, this really gives us an idea, Tommy, I think what a, a built environment is all about. What are we seeing here? Uh, the, the silent things that we're not uh, talking about that really impacts a built environment. Well, I believe that we have to be careful that we should not just focus on buildings. You know, if there's going to be more storms or flooding, we really have to focus as well on people. Mm -hmm. And resiliency means a lot of things. You know, there's many things that happen due to climate, but also resiliency is we don't want people displaced out of the city that mm -hmm. um, because they can't afford to live here for whatever reason. And mm -hmm. they need to be resilient also in the changed environment. But as the city becomes more expensive, mm -hmm. we, um, we need to recognize resiliency includes people. And that's right. true, whether it be terrorist acts, or whatever catastrophe that happens, um, resiliency is about people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think even the uh, the generals in the Pentagon are saying climate change is the number one threat to the United States and to the world. And that's something when you look at this photograph and you see there's nothing but a sea of people uh, on this asphalt and the buildings on both sides, even though we have the trees and we're about 37% under canopy in Washington, D.C., we still have a long way to go to make this really comfortable. Uh, but the mayor is really behind this. What does that actually mean for you and what you're doing, Tommy? And what does it mean for the citizens of Washington, D.C. to have elected officials that really believe we have to take care of the environment? Well, I, when Muriel Bowser was first elected mayor, she was challenged with, um, are you going to help protect the environment? And she said, listen, I believe what's good for the environment is good for the economy. So of course mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And she's never wavered from that to say these things should not be separated. What's good for the environment is good for our economy. Mm -hmm. So the mayor is also very concerned about low income residents and being sure that they're protected when there's floods and long periods of heat. Mm -hmm. And so we are looking towards trying to build and fund um, resiliency hubs areas where people can get into a cool area have, and if the power's out, they can have their phones and their medicines cooled and, and phones recharged. So having the mayor um, embrace this, it's, it's also about transparent data. So everybody mm -hmm. can look at the data that we're gathering so that they can make decisions, they can help the city. That's why we're the first lead platinum city in the world. It's mm -hmm. not just the investments we've made, but it has a lot to do with our data and our plans and our um, transparency. Yeah. And also too, Tommy, I think the way that you're involving the citizenry and we're going to get into uh, that as far as uh, equality across all citizens, but this pathways towards a carbon free DC, 
Uh, is that just hyperbole or is that actually possible? Every jurisdiction in the country has to do a five-year plan of what's the going to be their energy needs in five years and where are they going to get it? We took our comprehensive energy plan and turned it into a roadmap of how do we get to um, net zero hmm. by 2050 and half net zero by um, 2032. Mm -hmm. So carbon-free DC, we, um, we have a roadmap and we know things are going to change. There's going to be inventions. As you've noted, the um, solar panels are so much cheaper and more efficient. Mm -hmm. There's things that will happen to help us get there, but you've got to have a roadmap. And our comprehensive energy plan is measured by greenhouse gas production, mm -hmm. not by how much energy you need. Mm -hmm. That's a very smart way of putting it. I know you've been at this uh, for a while, uh, but looking at the next steps and uh, where are we going uh, 2025, 2030, uh, 2050 in all of this? Well, we're going to reimagine and retrofit the built environment mm -hmm. that you um, windows are going to have to be high performance windows so that you don't heat up like the inside of a car, but it, you can balance temperature. We're going to have to retrofit our buildings, move more towards air source heat pumps. We have to create more um, getting, really harvesting heat from other areas, whether it be back of computer services or um, servers or off the, the subway lines, you need to harvest heat for hot days instead of just burning fossil fuel. And then utilize the sun in order to cool you. Now, how do you do mm -hmm. that? Is that we plan to have 10% of the energy that's used by the whole city be mm -hmm. generated by solar within the city by 2035. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be renewable. So the last thing is you have to have buildings use less energy mm -hmm. and buildings that use less energy that interact better with the outdoors, harvest other sources of energy are more livable, they're more resilient, they're nicer to be in. And so we, um, we're on course to do that. Yeah, you know, and uh, as the old saying goes, the, the very best kilowatt is the one you don't have to use. And I think that's actually where you're going. Vision for 2050, I think uh, we've covered that pretty well. Uh, but what are you adding into that mix that may be the citizens here, but also the citizens around the United States and abroad that will uh, be seeing this? are not really aware of how DC is, is leading the way. So the first thing is, how do we fund the retrofits? We created a green bank that's funded by the city to take high risk loans when it's related to um, energy. We, as you said, we have a sustainable energy utility. That utility, all they do is save that kilowatt from being spent. And mm -hmm. that's like creating kilowatt. And then we're the first city in America to pass building energy performance standards. We have these carrots and these incentives, but now using Energy Star and benchmarking our buildings, they're gonna to have to meet our building energy performance standards. And New York City did it shortly after us, and it's being looked at across the nation that, and it's through direct government regulation, you are gonna to have to meet the Energy Star standard or there will be a large fine, but we're mm -hmm. gonna help you do it. We're going to do energy audits. We'll do prescription, prescription ways of how to meet that if you want. Seattle's done something similar with their energy audits, but um, we're the first to do building energy performance standards. And that's where the government is saying, we're gonna meet these goals by um, by deadline. Yeah, and I'll, I'm gonna throw that back, this back in again, that you have the stormwater retention credits, uh, which is like uh, the carbon credits. And I think uh, Washington DC is just being very innovative. And I think it's just marvelous what you're doing. Uh, looking at uh, combining all these together, uh, to make this happen, how are you doing that? Because you're weaving, uh, you know, everything, housing, health, transportation, uh, you know, opportunity, tools, requirements, uh, innovation, you know, all this is embedded in here. How do you manage all of that? Well, we work with our sister agency partners. When the Department of Housing um, is willing to retrofit their buildings, then we help fund that and then say, hey, while we're there, let's... Um, let's put a new roof on that will mm -hmm. last 20 years and then let's cover it with solar. Mm -hmm. And so it's really through these partnerships and we provide the funding and we get the funds through surcharges on energy from mm -hmm. the ratepayers. 
and we get it from compliance payments. If you can't get the solar you're required to have, you have to provide us a compliance payment. So we have creative mm -hmm. ways to take funds that are not taxes, but it's based mm -hmm. on energy use, water use, um, impervious area surface, and you know how that works together. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it is kind of a, a cloth that we weave together and it, it does work together. So yes, we have a lot to, a lot of expectations and benefits to any building homeowner that wants to retrofit their yards, maybe add solar, use less energy, weatherize, all these things. And now we won't need to get into it now, but as you may know, we've created the third office of urban agriculture for any city in America. And so now we're going to be pretty soon, we're going to be offering victory gardens to go with everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, very wise because again, that's adding more as far as a green sump is concerned and helping to draw down carbon from the air, which actually long-term is really going to cool it. Looking at the neighborhoods, I mean, we really do live in a built environment. I'm uh, blessed to be in single detached home area. Uh, a lot of people are not. So how do we take these buildings and turn them into something that actually is using less energy, but also emitting less greenhouse gases and, uh, and actually trying to help cool the environment and not just heat it? It's a great question. As you may know, DC has added more green roofs over the past five years than any other city in the country. We have major incentives for putting green roofs because they not only capture stormwater and then filter stormwater, they also cool the buildings. So by adding green roofs, and then we require anytime you rebuild a building over 50% um, renovate or build a new building, you have to capture a certain amount of stormwater around your building. And they do that by putting, you know, large, low impact development, best management practice plantings um, around the buildings. And that cools things. It all works together. And then we're going to have to be very innovative of how we, um, where we find energy. We have two buildings now in the District of Columbia that uses geothermal to heat their buildings off the sewer pipe that goes by their building. Mm -hmm. And so we can do more and really think more about how to do this. And so we're going to have to be careful, as we know, and as you've seen in the city, we built a lot of buildings that have just glass walls where the windows mm -hmm. don't open. We're going to have to open windows again. We're going to have to harvest the energy from the environment to help our buildings breathe and to be healthy. Thank you for being with us, Tommy Wells, as we create the Emerald Planet. As a world-class model for what's coming in the future, the Department of Energy and Environment of Washington, D.C. is the first platinum lead city in the world. And that really does mean something. And we're going to be talking about Climate Ready D.C. as a model for many other localities. But one of the things we can say about the Honorable Tommy Wells, who is the director of D.C. Department of Energy and Environment, he is constantly going around the world, interacting with his peers, uh, being involved with the United Nations as far as the uh, climate change and the 17 sustainable development goals of how do we blend energy environment and how do we actually get climate ready? So Tommy, looking at uh, climate ready DC, how do we actually get to these points that we're looking at right here? And why to, in this lower right-hand corner, we've got the windmills and the solar and other things going and the capital looming in the background. How does all this mesh together for the future of DC, but the future of the United States and possibly the world? So we know that under the Paris Agreement, we need to cut our greenhouse gases that we cause anywhere in the, in the country. But one of the things we also know is that Cities have been the problem with industrialization, but cities are also the solution. You can get so many more efficiencies through being smart about how your city works. So Clean Energy DC is a energy plan to cut the greenhouse gases from our buildings. Our buildings are responsible for 74% of all the greenhouse gases we cause. 
So the way to manage it, it's like a pie. You shrink the pie and that is by using less energy, retrofitting mm -hmm. the built environment. And then you increase the renewable piece, slice of the pie. And so it gets even bigger the more you shrink it. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the visual of how that works. But that's how we're going to address it. But in Clean Energy DC, which really came out of Climate Ready DC, that told us what's going to happen to our city. Hotter, mm -hmm. wetter, and a lot wilder with these storms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at the wild part of this, uh, this is something that uh, you're addressing. We talked about this uh, some moments ago. Well, let's go back and revisit. How is this wild nature of climate where we have these very intense uh, high energy storms? Now, there some of them are being called cloud bombs. Uh, how is that affecting uh, the built environment we have here, but also the 300 or more legacy cities all over the United States? Well, in particular, we, we know we're a city on two rivers. And most cities in America, older cities, are built on waterways. So we're all familiar with flooding, whether you're on the Mississippi River or you're on a coastal city, we, we're familiar with flooding. The difficulty that we're not familiar with are these microbursts mm -hmm. to where tremendous amounts of rain and wind gets dropped in one small area to where it can be raining and flooding near my home, but just two miles away, the sun is shining. Mm -hmm. And these microbursts are intense. We had our first derecho, I guess about 10 years ago. We had never heard of a derecho. And then this storm comes and it blows down trees, takes out the power lines, takes weeks in some neighborhoods to get the power back up. And the amount of water that was dumped was incredible. So we have to create resiliency from inside the city when we're used to protecting the city from the waterways on the edges of our cities. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at uh, this uh, chart here, as far as the impacts are going on, we see sea level rise. Uh, we're looking at stream weather and all that, but people say sea level rise, Washington, DC, 125 miles away from the ocean. How does it get sea level rise? And how is this happening to cities across the country? Some of them thousands of miles away from the ocean. Well, for us, um, that's a great question because people sometimes forget that we may be pretty far from the ocean, but our rivers are tidal. So when mm -hmm. high tide means our rivers are higher, low tide, the opposite. We have one river, the Anacostia River, to where the river flows both ways. Eventually, you know, it flows out but because of the rising tides, it flows both ways. And what that means for us, we've had over about 50 years, an increase of our um, sea level rise by 11 inches, almost mm -hmm. a foot, and it's still coming up. So a lot of the homes and built environment, roads and such, were really predicated on a lower um, level of water for our, our rivers, which are impacted by the oceans. So that's what it means for the city, for our city, that um, we're impacted by the, the ocean levels. Yeah, and you were talking about this earlier, as far as we have to really uh, retrofit the cities for human beings. We see this image here of extreme heat. Uh, they're now saying that there are many cities, uh, not yet in the United States, but in places in uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, that actually, and even Australia, are becoming uninhabitable by people in certain months of the year, that really people are not going to be able to live there as we move forward. So uh, what are you seeing? We see the participation and extreme weather uh, images here. How are we seeing more of this in Washington, D.C.? And I'm camping on this slide right now because there's so much in this that you've shared with us, Tommy, that I think we really need to raise the issues. Well, you... you I really appreciate you kind of making that point because at the Paris Agreement, they started off saying, let's not have temperature rise on average more than two degrees Celsius mm -hmm. based on from the industrial area. And they wanted a unanimous signing of that agreement. And there were countries like the Marshall Islands that said, if it gets to two degrees Celsius, we won't have a country. And just the whole diaspora that we mm -hmm. see people leaving cities or leaving countries 
moving from one area to another. Mm -hmm. And because of the extreme heat, that that is already caused the agreement to be at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In DC, you know, we'll, we'll have a heat emergency for a couple of days. Well, within the next, you know, few years, that will be a week. And mm -hmm. then it'll be two weeks. And what it means for us is that um, infrastructure starts to, to change. Mm -hmm. your, your metro rails start to warp. Mm -hmm. The intensity of the storms because of the heat and the evaporation of the water becomes more explosive. And we've already seen that out in the ocean. Cooling temperature, hotter waters are creating bigger and more intense and more hurricanes that are pushing up into our country and it will right. affect DC. So the climate has changed and it's rapidly changing. Yeah, and the storm surge is making a huge uh, impact. I uh, wanted to get to this, looking at the, the uh, heat waves, this is something you're saying is gonna be increasing uh, over the years, maybe even year by year as we go forward towards 2050. Uh, how do we address that so that we don't really have this? Because you see these stars and, <laughs> you know, this is scary. Well, we know that high heat can knock out your power grid. So think about what it's like to be in your car with the windows rolled up on a 100 degree day, but no air conditioning. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of these glass buildings that we built will feel like within five hours mm -hmm. if their power goes out because the grid could not withstand the heat because of all the air conditioning um, draw on it, and then people will have to evacuate the buildings. Mm -hmm. So the way we have to deal with it is that we have to cool the city. We have to have a smarter grid. We have to be able to um, really withstand this changed extreme climate of, again, not just the, the heat, but it helps create the, the soup, the mix, the chemical kind of reaction of the explosiveness of the storms together. Mm -hmm. So we have to plant trees, put on green roofs, create more rain gardens. We've got to green the city. Everybody knows what it feels like when a hot day, you're walking mm -hmm. down a sidewalk and pretty soon you have mature trees on both sides of you. You feel the temperature drop by about 10 mm -hmm. degrees. Right. That's, um, that's real. And so we, um, you know, I was impressed you noted earlier that our tree canopy is around 37%. And our goal is to get to at least to 40% by 2032 and we're well on our way to getting there but the tree canopy is so important for absorbing water and you know capturing um you know co2 but then also cooling our city yeah and just like with the urban forest that we actually planted we're you know six feet from where i'm sitting right now is that it's just amazing in about the next five to seven years uh, the entire backyard will start being under canopy, and that's going to make a huge uh, difference. Heavy rain events. This is something that we're seeing more and more of, uh, and they're becoming more extreme and more violent. <clears throat> yeah, I think that <clears throat> everything has to be resilient now. You're not protected by um, large amounts of rain. And we um, are going to have to figure out how to manage more and more of it on the surface that we have to be able to capture it either on roofs or in bioswales along any paved areas. And, um, and again, trees expirate the, mm -hmm. the moisture at a far higher rate than, you know, than just evaporation. Right. So managing on the flooding, we're also gonna have to look at, you know, we have areas where Fort McNair is down at Buzzard Point and that is the entry level for flooding out that part of the Southwest city. Mm -hmm. There used to be a canal on the street that goes right up next to Fort McNair. It's mm -hmm. a low piece of um, land. So one thing that we have to do is also think about not just stopping water from coming in the city. How do you channel it to get it out? Um, mm -hmm. Can we drop our parks um, four feet like they did in Copenhagen to capture rainwater? Are there ways to channel water capture water on the surface mm -hmm. um, by changing the built environment to protect catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I uh, did with the urban forest. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is through your DOEE department. Uh, but when they came to plant the trees, I said, I want to do it like they're doing it in India. You know, I want these a foot below the surface of the yard. And it's amazing, Tommy, on these heavy rain days, 
the the water is literally running across the yard, not down the yard, uh, towards where these uh, trees are, and going in and nurturing the roots. And these trees grew over two feet in the very first year they were planted, and so we were supercharging them. Uh, but what you're doing is really paying off. But we need to look at even different ways of putting these things in. Severe storms, and we're about running out of time. So uh, looking at this, Tommy, as we go forward, how do we reduce the negative impacts on our built environment, Washington, D.C., other cities? And how do we take those resources, the severe storms, the water, uh, even the, the uh, heat, and turn that into an asset and it becomes something that's a resource, not a waste. And well, we got about 30 seconds. Best example is we have a brownfield had toxic um, land that needed to be remediated. We put a solar farm on it and then put a fence around. <clears throat> and just that solar farm will be able to keep power going to over 780 households mm -hmm. to um, help them to be resilient. And you know, in, in that um, area over the solar farm, we've put indigenous meadows for butterflies, birds. Um, it, you know, is part of the ecosystem of the city. So thinking ourselves about renaturing the city, harvesting sunlight, harvesting air, all of those things together really will create, a, and we can reuse the water from the rain. Mm -hmm. So we just need to get more simpatico with the environment and we can manage this. Yeah, and I like your term, renaturing, or maybe as it's being said, rewilding the cities. Tommy Wells of DOEE, thank you very much as we create the Emerald Planet. As we look at the Department of Energy and Environment in Washington, D.C., a world class lead platinum city. We're looking at sustainability DC as not only just a concept, but actually action. And this is something that's very important to the director of DOEE, Department of Energy and Environment, the Honorable Tommy Wells. And uh, he's a man of action, but also very wise in many different ways as far as how we're going to be able to address uh, the future. But looking at sustainable DC, Tommy, why is it so important that we think about sustainability uh, now and not just wait until the environment becomes uh, much more severe, much worse. And we need to be building and redesigning and repurposing the city. And, and we also added just a while ago, rewilding the city. How does all this fit together? Well, <clears throat> a sustainable city is a healthy city. It's a city that, um, that balances with nature much better. It's a, a city that that um, protects people and assets, so it's livable. But I, I think that um, you know the things about a sustainable city that people sometimes don't think about. It's what you just said. When you take a drainage ditch and you re rewild it into mm -hmm. a serpentine stream, so it functions like it was intended to. And then it filters water when the water goes back down through it and it doesn't bring silt right into your rivers. That mm -hmm. sustainable um, stream that came out of that drainage ditch, it cools the area around it. It gives people beautiful places to walk, mm -hmm. um, you know, to increase their health and increase um, how they feel. And so I think the other thing that's good to note is um, it doesn't just become sustainable for people. Things come back. You know, we're on our seventh generation of eagles after they had not been here for over almost 70 years, 50 years at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and they're in the Arboretum and they live entirely off the Anacostia River. So making a sustainable city for us as humans, it becomes sustainable again in so many ways for nature. And mm -hmm. it becomes a great place to be and live. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's uh, sustainability. Uh, go through these, how these interact and uh, and why is equity in this? What's what's important about that? Because we think of an economy, environment, uh, but how do we get to the third aspect of this? So one simple way is um, 
with the mayor, our mayor often says, what's good for the environment is good for the economy. And the best example of that is, is that in the areas where there's mature trees, those neighborhoods, the value of the homes are higher, the health of the residents around them is higher. People have measured and said, even people's mental health is better if you live around trees. So we have neighborhoods that um, maybe they have been public housing or other large track areas that have very few trees. And so the equity issue is that if you feel better, you're healthier and you're cooler and all those things, why aren't we getting enough trees planted in our poor neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods? And that's where the equity comes in. And also the equity comes in, um, where do we build affordable housing? So we want to protect the environment. We want to support the economy, but let's not build affordable housing in flood zones or um, certainly we have to be careful that when we create better building standards to use less energy, that that's true for our affordable housing too. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's a matter of environmental justice and social justice. Right, you know, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, sustainability plan, you know, we're talking about why is it important? We're going over, you know, these three different areas, uh, but these images really tell us what you're all about as far as Washington, D.C., the diversity, including everyone and the uh, economic benefit of having a capital city right here, uh, but also making it fun. So how do we do this through DOEE uh, when you have all these other departments out there, you know, trying to do the best they can for the people at the same time? Well, I appreciate you asking that because it's that's the joy of this job, that not only do we protect and you know the environment and that we regulate air and emissions and all that to, to try to make things healthier but we also recognize and we have funding to do this in deploying solar we have mm -hmm. money that comes in for getting solar out on roofs so that we have more renewable energy so at the same time we use that money to train people to deploy solar and when you work in the solar industry you may be a customer rep you could be the HR person, or you could be the person that installs the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the solar panels. There's many jobs in that. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we train people for free and we get them into solar jobs. That's the fastest growing job market in the country is, mm -hmm. is around solar. And so mm -hmm. that's about equity and amount of satisfaction I get knowing that we're part of the solution to help people that need to be trained or retrained get into the job market and that we help you know fund that market when you get a grant from us to install solar you have to look at these folks that we've trained first to give mm -hmm. them a job so we're a pipeline to work we um help the um help the planet and it's it's um it's really a virtuous circle that um is quite rewarding and I think, Tommy, also is when you're doing this training, you're actually bringing technical skills into communities in the past have been totally ignored and uh, really were not giving the opportunity because you say, well, there's no one that's really trained there. That's not true anymore. And I think that goes, uh, you know, as a, a big kudo to you as far as what you're doing with the DOEE. -E. But this vision of, uh, you know, the swimmable, fishable uh, Anacostia, that really applies to all the city, even if you're not right beside the river. Isn't that correct? Well, absolutely. And think about it. Everybody's familiar with the Potomac River. You know, Lady Bird Johnson and, and folks said, we need to make this river healthy and clean. Meanwhile, the Anacostia River remained one of the 10 most compromised dirty rivers in America. Mm. Restoring the Anacostia River, which is where it's kind of the dividing line between the haves and have nots that the lower income residents did not have access directly to a cleaner Potomac river and their river was dirty. So restoring the Anacostia river is it's an issue of equity, but it's also great for the environment. Um, as I said, with that pair of eagles that are on their seventh generation, they feed solely off the Anacostia river. Mm -hmm. you, you can remember a time, when the Anacostia River was so toxic that, you know, fish were compromised in ways that I don't even want to go into. So mm -hmm. the fish have gotten cleaner 
every year. Um, we have an invasive species called blue catfish. If, if you or anybody brings me a blue catfish out of the Anacostia River, if I catch one, I'll eat it. They are delicious fish and we want them out of the river and they grow up in the, in the Anacostia River and it's, um, it's becoming a fishery again, a place to, to really recreate and have fun. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I appreciate um, how this all works together, especially in terms of equity, that the Anacostia River is open to everyone. Yeah. And the, the last thing I'll say, when you start restoring the environment in a city, a city, cities used to be known to be inhab uninhabitable for wildlife and such. When you start restoring the environment, and you're the first to know this in any type of media, that an angler um, accidentally hooked about two days ago, a short-nosed sturgeon. Short-nosed sturgeon is extinct in many areas in the country now. Mm -hmm. And it's um, a species of um, on the, the list of protection because they're certain it will, or they're worried it will go extinct. And um, we haven't seen a sturgeon in the Potomac River for, um, I don't know, 50 to 70 years. Mm -hmm. Wildlife's coming back. We have um, nesting ravens. They haven't been here for 50 years. We have the, the Nelson Sparrow. Hasn't been seen um, until just now since the Civil War. So rebuilding the cities to where it's healthy for people, it also becomes healthy for nature too. Yeah, and you're doing it based on these building blocks we're looking at right here. And uh, I want to touch these lightly because we still have some images I want to share before we finish. Uh, but these building blocks all work together. So how do you, through DOEE, -E, really make these work together? Well, the Sustainable DC um, plan, you can go to our website, um, doee.dc.gov, and we keep a, a kind of a report card. And every, um, every Earth Day, we publish the report card of how we're doing in all these areas. Because obviously, DOEE doesn't do it all. We have sister agencies and other partners, but we keep the report card on this plan, mm -hmm. and you can see how we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, family of plans. This is something, uh, actually, I've not seen this before. Uh, probably should have. Uh, but how does this family of plans uh, mesh and blend together so that you actually, uh, year to year, you're talking about sustainable, in essence, your own sustainable development goals. How are you uh, able to use this so that we know exactly where we are year to date? Well, I think in a couple of ways. One is, is that it's our accountability with the public. They see the plan. They usually help to write the plan with us. And then they hold us accountable um, to meeting these goals. These plans are also our roadmaps of how we're going to achieve each thing and you know that we have in those plans. And so that roadmap tells us where we need to invest our funds. How are we going to get there? And then the other thing is, is that I love that you know we have a democracy, people run for office, then other people come into office and that changes. This is the continuity. This is how the public knows that we're not starting over every time a new person is elected. We've agreed on these plans. This is where we're going. Hold us accountable for this. And also, you want to know your tax taxes are going. You're funding these plans to be implemented. It, it's a it's kind of the the compact between the government and the government and the governed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really the institutional memory is uh, what you're saying there. Uh, going out on the uh, plan structure. Uh, and then getting to the primary stakeholders. Let's hit this lightly. We're down below a minute. Uh, plan structure, about 20 seconds. And we want to see these faces and we're going to go out on these. Well, we have to spend a lot of time in the community, in every corner of the community. That Sustainable DC 2.0 plan was written with input, equal input from the richest part of the city, from the poorest part of the city. So you have to keep everyone um, invested in it, but we have to do the work to be sure that everyone is involved. And so then, you know, then people understand when, uh, when these plans come out that why does their power bill cost more or why, what are they paying for? You know, I'm, I um, created the bag bill for DC. You got to pay a nickel for what you thought was free disposable plastic bag, but mm -hmm. every nickel goes towards cleaning up the Anacostia river. There's a nexus. 
And so the plans um, into implementation, um, you've got to have community input and you've got to have great leadership. But we've got the best residents of any city in the country that support what we do. That's fantastic. Thank you. This is Tommy Wells, uh, Director DOEE, as we create the Emerald Planet.